I'm Steve Backshaw, and you're listening to the Aussie Wildlife Show. All right, guys, welcome to the Aussie Wildlife Show. Adrian here, and I'm here, of course, with Steve. Good day, guys. And we're very lucky today to have with us Ben Britton, the director of Wildcat Conservation Centre. G'day, mate. Morning, guys. How are you going? Very awesome. good. Mate, thanks for having us here today. Good to you could fit us in in your travels up north, and uh, you've been out and about a bit yourselves. Yeah, we have, and we definitely wanted to catch up. I haven't seen you for probably 10 years. We did a show together in Adelaide. Well, I was trying to remember when you contacted us, actually, how long ago it would have been, and um, it was 10 years, was it? I, you're you're I making me so. feel old. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, let's say it was about eight. Yeah, go with six. Six yeah. is good. Yeah, that's about six years ago. Yeah, I think we're down with Nat Geo. I think there was a, a competition winners and they won a visit from ourselves and you guys brought along some of your amazing animals. Yeah, no, I, I do remember I had a few days down in Adelaide, which was nice. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, we had some lunch, had a, had a chat. Mate, the first thing we noticed when we came here to the Wildcat Conservation Centre is just such a tidy, beautifully presented place. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we, we turn around and I guess pride ourselves a lot on the fact that I think it's not only the work we put in with the animals but the grounds and everything. It's a privilege to have these animals and be able to do the work we do with them and so then that results in making sure that we look after them to the best of our ability. And also that um, I think it's a big thing when people come out here and they, they look at the way you manage uh, the animals, but also the way you manage the, 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 the property in the centre, you know, and, and, and that does reflect in people realising that you're actually doing, hopefully, um, a good thing by looking after your animals and your care. I couldn't agree more. I always make sure I've got the glass in my enclosures clean. Like, the animals probably don't care if the glass is clean, but it just presents well and gives people that impression. Yeah, exactly. I think I'm always saying to all, all our staff, a very small team of, uh, of four or five, that attention to detail, because... Attention to detail, I think, is, ties into that observation skills, which is so important when you're looking after animals, whatever the animals are, whether it's cats or reptiles or, or, or birds. And so, you know, that attention to detail, if you're seeing little things, you know, whether it be some weeds popping up in a garden or some cobwebs that need a bit of removing or, you know, it's a glass that needs cleaning on the snake enclosure, then it shows me that you're looking and you're actually paying that attention to detail, which then reflects across to when you're observing your animals, hopefully, each day to make sure that they're um, any little thing any little changes in behaviour that you're picking up on those things. So we really try and drive home to our staff here about that attention to detail and observation and how important it is. And so it's a bit of the old Mr Miyagi, the, the karate kid about wipe on, wipe off. But if you turn around doing one thing in one area of your um, life, I guess, and then it translates across to the others. And so I think that's important, you know, for, for staff or, or keepers that they turn around and really look at that thing and don't get too... No, no, I'm just a keeper, you know. I'm just looking after the animal. It's a, the holistic approach. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. So you've got some big cats here. You've got three species. Yeah, we've got three species of cat here at the moment. So cheetahs are our biggest cat. We've got cheetahs, serbals and caracal. And the, the primary, we've only got the three, the three species we've got at the moment all fit into uh, the geographical home range of where we've been doing our work in uh, Botswana for, for a while. And so it just so happens that we've got three uh, African species uh, though moving ahead over the next couple of years we'd like to develop and get some um, Southeast Asian um, wildcat species but the focus is definitely going to be on the smaller cat species you've got 40 species of wildcat in the world uh, most people if you went to them and said name me some species of wildcat they're going to rattle off you know your you know, lion tiger leopard jaguar possibly probably cheetah but if you realize that um, there's 33 of that 40 they're actually considered small medium or small cats and so the focus of our center is to try and raise a bit of awareness about those smaller cat species and let people know that there is more than just the big guys and so the cheetah will be our biggest cat that we ever have here it depends who you speak with i guess some people consider them big cats and classify them big cats to me uh the big cats are your panthera genus you know your 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 real big guys your lion tiger uh leopard and jaguar um and the relative subspecies so um cheetahs and their behavior cheetahs working with them they're much more similar to a, one of those smaller cats in, in, their, in their mentality. and so, uh, But they'll be the biggest cat that we have here. And that's the world's fastest land mammal. Yeah, so a good claim to fame, isn't it? You know, so um, it's tough when you're playing soccer with them. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I used to think I was all right, but, uh, you know, they, I can't quite keep up with them here. But, yeah, no, they did get up to those speeds, you know, 96, 97 k's over about three or four seconds. And so, yeah, sight to behold when they do get up to those, you know, top speeds. And so quickly too. It's, I've got a little wombat I'm raising at the moment. They can get up to 40 k's an hour with their stupid little legs and their fat bodies. <laughs> <laughs> 
Why do you reckon that? Why do, why do you reckon they run so fast, guys? I, 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 I get asked that. I, I don't know. What are they Getting running away from? from? Cheaters? We don't have. Could be. <laughs> they wouldn't do a very good job of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I'm not sure. You know, I've had a bit to do with wombats earlier in my career, and uh, yeah, people get a bit surprised when you actually do see the motor. You know how quick they can go. I didn't know it was 40 k's, but uh, there you go. I've learned yeah, something. That sounds really quick. Yeah. For... It's bizarre. Mm. You drive the car at 40 k's and look out the window and just imagine those little legs going. Trying to keep up alongside you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so these animals here are part of a conservation program. For for having a security population of these animals. Yeah, the cheetahs, for example, all the che- all the captive cheetahs in the world, you've got a, uh, less than 7,000 cheetahs remaining in the wild. Um, so that's wild cheetahs. So about six and a half, 6,700 cheetahs, roughly, they estimate, left in the wild. And you've got then a, a, a few hundred in captivity. And so all the ones that are in captivity are part of an international stud book, which is controlled based around their uh, genetics. And so cheetahs... Uh, historically went through a genetic bottleneck and so cheetahs generally speaking are all quite related already and so it's very important to keep that as much genetic variance as we can with the remaining population and so any movements of cheetahs the bread within the stud book is is controlled and, and they move around because of their genetics and so if you turn around and say we got five cheetahs here and we turned around and specifically when we wanted to look at acquiring cheetahs we contacted the stud book look we said we want to bring in cheetahs that aren't currently represented in australia and new zealand uh, there's a few institutions in australia that already do breed cheetahs quite successfully some other institutions that have cheetahs just for display purposes, for educational purposes. And so we wanted to try and do a mixture of both. So we said, no, look, we're going to bring in five individuals to help establish another core group for breeding potential here. So we wanted to make sure those genetics were important. And, and they were. We've, there's recently recommendations that just come out in the last couple of weeks. And one of our females here has, has been given the top rating. So she's the most important cheetah to be bred in Australia at the moment. And so the recommendations have come through with different males to try and introduce to her or take her to them, whichever way we do it. And then any cubs that they produce, again, will be part of this international stud book. So they might move around within Australia and New Zealand, uh, or they could potentially end up going overseas to part of one of the international breeding programs. And so I think, yeah, when you talk about conservation breeding, people often, well, you've got two different groups. Some people ask more questions about it and go, well, how does it actually help? And other people just take it on, on, on its merit. But I think with any of these breeding programs in captivity, it's important they are managed well. And so you've got that turnaround. There's somebody looking over, seeing, going, yeah, OK, well, make sure we're getting the best out of these animals in captivity. And so, as you say, it's insurance population for if we don't do our job in the wild. Hopefully, or when I say wild, um, it's depending on where the species is at, and I guess, and there's no real... Where is wild nowadays, I guess, which is another topic we're going to chat about, but it's that thing, if we turn around and go, if there's no cheetah, say, in Botswana, for example, which is a much more accurate statement for me to make, then you turn around and go, rightio, let's look at what genetics, uh, Botswana genetics we have in the cheetah population in captivity that we could possibly return back there. We're not at that point yet. You know, if, if we still, and I go, I go, we as the global community still do our job to conserve remaining wild cheetah populations, hopefully there'll never be a need for us to have to return them back to the wild. But it's insurance, insurance in case we don't get it right over there. So what status are they in the wild at the moment in, say, Botswana? Yeah, look, if you look at their, uh, their, basically from a listing point of view, they're very close to being listed as endangered. You know, it depends. They're geographically endangered in lots of areas uh, throughout Africa as a continent. And so you're getting all these isolated populations, which is what happens with lions, what happens with lots of animals, where you're getting these little um, populations scattered all over Africa. And in the cast, they'd you know, be able to spread right across the continent. They'd have these home ranges where the genetics could move around naturally. Whereas we're finding now you're getting these little isolated pockets which are now cut off by, you know, towns, villages, farms, etc. And so the animals then, when they risk leaving the formal protected areas, that's when they run into these human wildlife conflict because there's there's very little, like I was mentioning before, when people talk about the wild, well, where is the wild? I always, when I have discussions with visitors out here, and they'll say, oh, you know, well, should they be in the wild or how many there in the wild? It's a, a term that we everybody uses a lot, though I think it needs a bit of... Uh, analysing at the same time to go, well, where are you actually talking about? Because if people go, they're better off in the wild or we should return them to the wild or how many are there in the wild, I always try and then ask them, well, let's break that down, where are you talking about? So you're talking about Botswana, you're talking about Kenya, you're talking about East Africa as a region. And so 
because there's not too much wild left, <laughs> unfortunately, where you look at it's Africa or South America or anywhere around the world. You do still have areas of wilderness, uh, most definitely, but there's this uh, term of the wild. It's um, a bit of a broad statement, and I always like to sort of say, well, where are you actually talking about? Yeah, it's an interesting one. You could, you could imagine if there was a, a park that didn't have any left, you might want to consider a reintroduction. I mean, I'm just thinking here, of here in Australia, that's been a bit of a theme this trip. Yeah, it's that thing I think where definitely you look at there's some massive reserves in Africa that are fully fenced. Krug, like you look at Kruger National Park, famous, well-known national park, um, where you have to actively manage your animals and actively move them in and out of these reserves. And so if you just keep a, a fenced population in, obviously from a genetic point of view, it's not going to be a very strong population after a period of time. You've got to be constantly moving animals in and out, which can be done really, really well. And it is done really well with lots of species over there in, in Africa. And I think that's an important way to turn, or a tool I guess you could use to turn around and maintain those populations. Those animals then are already um, habituated to life that's as close to you know being out there free roaming as uh, free roaming as possible and so those animals are going to take the transition to being released a lot better than say animals here like if we breed our cheetahs here if you pick those cubs up or adolescent cubs and take them back and drop them off in Botswana they're going to be looking at you going uh, what time are you back, Ben? Like, what, should we expect about four o'clock? Uh, you're going to come back and pick us up in the afternoon, and so it's it's, the, it's not going to be very successful. And that, that's the same with um, lots of different pro- reintroduction programs here in Australia. You know, they've got to be managed well, and you've got to be, you know, if you, you're not going to have a population that's going to be trying to release on public display, for example, is going to be off public display. You know, so that's where I think there's with, with conservation breeding programs, they they come in different forms. You know, so if you turn around and you're a zoo and you breed a particular species, then yet yeah, that might be play a role in conservation, but it might be conservation purely through education that people come and can learn about those animals you've bred and hopefully that promotes a sense of conservation. Or you can have other facilities where their full focus is purely breeding for Re-release, and you usually find those places then aren't on public display. You know, with um, the downgrade of how many animals are left in the wild, with the amount that are left in the wild, is that all down to humans, or, or is is there any disease involved? Or yeah, look, unfortunately, I think it is. <laughs> you look at most yeah. um, most species, whether it's here in Australia or um, around the world, and number one usually comes back to habitat loss and uh, human wildlife conflict you know and that's because most animals would save themselves if we gave them half a chance and that's the reality of it but we just don't give them that chance and and i think you look at the growing human population it's humans are always going to end up unfortunately um being the priority and coming out on top and so we they sort of get what's left that's where a lot of the, the, the stuff that's going on in Africa to try and conserve cat populations is trying to get to a point where people don't see it as us and them, um, that they see us as part of the environment, the animals are part of the environment, how we can live with these cats and trying to give them tools and technology so they can live with, whether it's lions or leopards or cheetahs in, in the area, and that you can both share the landscape because we've learned that doing the us and them approach isn't really going to work long term in 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 the past even here in australia you'd do things where you'd have areas where they're going to do a development and they'd go oh look there's a koala population here in the area that's okay yeah we're going to do the right thing about the koalas we'll turn around and fence that area off or protect that area that's for the koalas and we'll put the housing estate here and then the koalas unfortunately over a couple of years they feed in these big arcs as the eucalypts come into you know tip and and the koalas get actually well we we want to go over there now, but now you put a road in the way, or you want to put a, and and so that's where you, some some countries do it better, where they you know try and build these land bridges and stuff to try and join these areas. Um, so a lot of the work I think over in Africa is similar to what works needs to be done right around the world. It's about setting up these wildlife corridors and trying to so um, animals can migrate as, as naturally as they once did. It's very interesting, isn't it? Trevor talked about uh, Trevor from Secret Creek was talking about his quals, how a lot of people were concerned about having quals from a certain province of Tasmania, but he went and got ones from all the four different um, populations that were available, and he's now got these really genetically rich animals, which is probably really important these days in declining species. Oh, exactly, and that's where often if you look at a species as a whole, you can turn around and say, oh, that's their 
status is either vulnerable or endangered, etc. But you can have a lot of um, lo- lo- localised um, extinction in, in species. And so if you look at an animal like the caracal, which is one of the other species we work with here, across southern Africa, you can still get permits to shoot caracals. They're considered vermin in some areas of South Africa. Whereas in North Africa, they're endangered. And then throughout Asia, they're also endangered. And so then you look at that as a whole and go, oh, well, we've still got, we've still got plenty in South Africa. So you could take that approach. We've still got plenty of caracals. It's okay. Though the genetics of those caracals in, in North Africa, would, if you looked at them, would be quite different um, in, in a lot of ways to those other caracals in South Africa. And to keep a strong population, the strong genetics moving forward, then it's important we do conserve those and we don't just end up, you know, all the eggs in the one basket in one area, so to speak. And so that's where I think that's, it's like you mentioned with Trevor with the quolls there. People sort of got to start looking at that and going, right, yeah, let's not focus too much on the overall. We've got to look at those individual populations at the same time and how important those individuals are because you might find a population of might be 30, 40 lions in one small, you know, reserve in Africa, but genetically they're, they're actually quite important animals. When you look at things like lions and that, um, that they obviously live in bigger prides uh, than the three cats that you would have here are more solitary or is that part of the problem there'll never be as many cheetahs as there are lions oh that that's more uh i guess lions are the only true social cat you know they have those prides like you mentioned before mm. uh, cheetah for example though uh male cheetahs especially will form coalitions for most of their life and so when the when the cubs get too old and mum, mum leaves them behind and wanders off and says, kids, it's over to you guys. You'll get the, often the female and the male cubs will all stick together as a little group and then the females after uh, a couple of weeks or a couple of months often go, boys, I've had enough of you lot. And then they'll move off and, and, and generally speaking, the female cheetahs will remain solitary there their whole life. Whereas the boys will usually stick together in a little coalition. And so you'd have two or three or four male cheetahs that spend their whole life together as that bachelor group, as that coalition that move around. Same with uh, lions. Not all male lions get a pride. It's that thing. They don't always get a pride. And so often you have lions that will live in a, a coalition of brothers for a period of time too. Um, though, yeah, the smaller cats, the servals and caracals, you know, they primarily are solitary. Though you look at, say, uh, an African leopard, which, again, is a solitary species, but quite an adaptable species. They can sometimes adapt to urbanisation better because they're solitary they can turn around and live in some suburban areas on the periphery of suburban areas quite successfully whereas you're not going to have a pride of lions being able to sneak in there uh, and hang around as much as you could with one sole leopard so i don't think necessarily the social structure plays that big role it just comes down to um um, space, you know, and, and as we were saying before about how, how we how much opportunity we get to give them to give them to survive. Caracols, beautiful looking cats. Glad you say so. Mm. It's um, a lot of people when we first got them, they're like brown. Oh, why are you getting caracols? We've tried them here in Australia. They're they're brown. They don't display well. No, they're not a great animal. And we said, well, we're gonna we're gonna get them in anyway. We're gonna do it. And since we've actually had them here, we've got currently the only pair in. Australia, unrelated pair, uh, Cato and Kaya, though there is other facilities that will be importing more caracals this year to set up a little genetic um, population, which is nice. I think people have seen them, and like you guys said, they're spectacular cats. Like Everything about them is beautiful, whether it's the eyes and the ears. or Yeah, no, I, I think they're amazing. Those ears are quite distinctive, aren't they? Very distinctive. A lot of people look at them and say, or they, they'll come in for a visit here to the centre and they'll go, oh, and you've got those cats here, you know, the ones with the, you know, you'll see the hands come up and they get little tufts on the end of the ears <laughs> and the ones that look a bit like a lynx. And you go, yeah, yeah, I know which ones you're talking about, it's the caracals, you know, and they get sometimes, them, and the servals confused because servals have pretty big ears. But yeah, those ears are fascinating. They've got about 20 different muscles in each ear um, alone. And so... And if you watch them, they do very fine movements with those ears and uh, with the, and the way it moves the feathery tufts on top. And there's a couple of different trains of thought. Some people think the ears are there for communication. Other people think it's there for camouflage. I think it's a bit of a mixture of both. Though There's lots of little subtle communications that we can watch our caracals communicating with each other with their ears. And this is where, obviously, that you can have the link between captive and over there in Africa where we're doing, doing the research, that we can observe behaviours here that might be tough for us to observe because it's quite a secretive cat over there that, that can translate. So when we're trying to learn about these animals, um, we turn around and go, actually, well, I think they might actually do a lot of communication with their ears because we've observed this in a captive state and then we can transfer that across to you know, Botswana or southern Africa where you might be trying to study them and research them. So there's definitely a good correlation between captivity 
and the wilderness areas over there in Africa, which is, is, which is basically the essence of our centre here, is trying to link those two and, and, and explain to people how the two are, you know, are linked. That's a very good point. I mean, some, some of the people, that, particularly things like leopards, I mean, people that study big cats, they're not necessarily going to be spending a lot of time looking at a leopard. They're going to be maybe looking at camera trap footage if they're lucky or prints or scats. Yeah, exactly. And that's where uh, those behavioural things, there's an example, uh, my, my favourite cat is the, the clouded leopard. It's nearly impossible to, to actually study them in the wild. You know, there's people that spend years in the field and, and, and they get glimpses if they're lucky. And so most of what we know about cloud leopards comes from captive populations, you know, and there's still so much unknown about them. They are quite a mysterious cat. And so when you look at the servals and the caracals and the cheetahs here, and also the way we manage them here allows them to uh, exhibit many, many natural behaviours and that's where we turn around and try and promote that as much as we can because we're always learning little things and then we can yeah, translate it across to, to Botswana. Can you talk a bit about the research station in Botswana? I've been fortunate about 10 years ago now. I, I met um, a guy by the name of uh, Dr Andre um, Snowman um, in Botswana, a property called Mashatu Game Reserve, and we sort of hit it off straight away as, as mates. And we're across there as, um, you guys know about hitting it off as mates, you know, <laughs> as um, when you meet somebody and you just connect and you click and you've got similar interests. Yeah, I'll find one one day. <laughs> <laughs> <Whoa. Awesome. laughs> That's about you and I, Steve. It just okay, as soon as you arrive, yeah, now, yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, because um, you promised not to bring up the cricket, so it's good. Yeah. Um, and, and you first, <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, we we hit it off straight away. And um, he was a researcher started working on uh, leopards and lions, and um, needed needed some funding and needed some assistance with different projects. And I said, well, look, let's see what we can do from Oz. And we started uh, through our work with Nat Geo. Uh, started doing some um, small uh, little short series over there for Big Cat Week and started taking some of our, our groups across so we could try and generate some funds for, for Andre and, and purchasing things like collars and, and camera traps like we mentioned before. And it just grew from there. It grew from there. Like We sort of um, uh, started going off over there on a more, more regular basis and uh, through our foundation, which is the Wildcat um, Conservation Foundation, we've been able to fund a lot of uh, his work over the last few years. It got to the point a few years back where he asked me to uh, join his, his research team, um, uh, which I was uh, quite honoured to do. And then uh, the last eight months, we've started construction on our purpose-built research camp, which is the Mashatu Research Camp, which is based in uh, Mashatu Game Reserve, which is where we've primarily been doing the work for so that, that period of time. And the camp will hopefully, um, there's a saying Africa time, which always uh, takes a little while for things to get done over there, though uh, hopefully we get finished off over the next couple of months and that's going to give us a base over there to, to work out. At the moment and over the last number of years, whenever we go there, we've got to stay at either one of the lodges or on the outside of the reserve and move around. And so it'd be nice to give us a purpose. It's a purpose-built camp. Uh, it's going to have a little lab, a uh, research facility there for um, even students that they can turn around and uh, international students if they come forward and put a, a proposal together where they want to do a particular study on a species. It doesn't have to be cats. It could be um, on, you know, bustards or African rock pythons or, you know, leopard tortoises. And uh, Steve's excited <laughs> yeah. about that one. Um, and, and say, look, but... I need somewhere to stay, you know, I need somewhere, somewhere to support that. And they could turn around and we could base themselves there and, and do their study. And so it's, it's a non-commercial camp, so it doesn't generate any, any, any funds from, you know, guests can't stay there. It's, it's purely, purely for researchers. So with, um, with that development, it's really exciting because it's something that it was an, a dream of Andre's for many, many years and, and, and I've sort of jumped onto that dream over the last number of years with him and it's going to be nice to see it completed later this year and uh, we can start using it uh, for, for its purpose. Very impressive. So when people support the Wildcat Conservation Centre, they're supporting the research that gets done too. Yeah, and that's where like we the our, our foundation supports our uh, our work, whether it's here at the centre uh, or over in Africa. And the great thing about our foundation too is. By keeping it small, uh, 98% of all funds we raise goes back to our core purpose, which is really high for any um, charity or foundation. And that's where I think, because you, you've got to be transparent, you've got to be uh, genuine and turn around and people know where their money's going. And so any money that comes into our foundation, as I said, 98% goes 
back to our core purpose, about 38% gets um, uh, spent in Africa for things like our research camp, uh, whether it's uh, vet expenses, uh, telemetry gear or camera traps. We just purchased uh, about 40-odd camera traps. At the beginning of this year, we've just, um, in June, I was across there um, setting up a new presence absence study for Caracal, and so we've just got 113,000 images back uh, from those camera traps, which we're slowly making our way through. But the great thing is, again, for people to get involved is we have a citizen science section on our website, which we've uploaded all those images to. And so uh, anybody, you know, school groups, um, you know, jump on there instead of Netflix one night, um, you can turn around and get in there and you can go through and help us catalogue these images and all the details on there, how to do it. It's quite an easy program to use. If you're not sure, there's a button you press, comes to us so we can identify it. But it's a way to try and get people involved and realise it's quite addictive actually if you get on there and you start what's the next image what's the next image um you'll catch us in a few of them probably too driving past or checking on cameras and so that's way that uh, another way that the funding goes through and uh, to different studies like that so 38 percent africa 60 percent uh gets used here at the center for our different breeding programs and the work we're doing here so uh, so that that 98 percent is something we're very proud of because no last time i checked with the acnc there was no other uh, animal-related, wildlife-based charity that sort of came close to that mark that they took so little out for administration. And that's because we don't draw uh, wages from it. We don't turn around and um, use it for anything, for any personal use at all. Uh, and it it's all goes back to our core purpose, which is the, the work we do with the cats. Do the governments over there help you at all? Uh, no, they don't really... Um, uh, support it through uh, from a financial point of view. Um, Mashat has been great by obviously giving us the the area to be, do the mm. camp, and um, but we do have the support of the Botswana government in the fact of um, establishing the camp there, and also trying to get locals involved and trying to get them involved in the in a the project, but also that educational side of thing we'll talk about before, which is really important, teaching people how giving them the skills to live with. And, and around these animals because you you know in, in, in western culture it was very quick especially with um and now i'm not looking at you adrian when i say this about with social media and and mobile phones and things nowadays <laughs> yeah um, adrian <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those things where it's very easy it's very easy to um i say carly's in the background now listening in and she's on her phone so bad example <laughs> though it's that thing where we very we, we see something and we either like or dislike and we get it's very instant you turn around and you turn around and go oh that's terrible hate that don't like that and so you could see somewhere hypothetically you see somewhere that shot a line for example which i'd never ever couldn't see any joy in shoot, shooting a line myself i have any joy and find any joy at all in doing that if you're a farmer, a subsistence farmer over there that's got five or six kids, you've got your wife, and your only livelihood is your cattle, and you've got a line that's coming in every couple of days, once a week, taking one of those, those cows. And every time that cow goes, you're basically just seeing that it's, you're losing money, you know, and you're getting to the stage where your, your, your wife and your children um, are starting to struggle, you know, and, and, and from a money point of view. And you, you've got your kids starving in front of you, and then you've got that line out there that's the cause of it. If, if any of us were in the same boat, we'd probably turn around and go, well, I've got to do something about that line. And so then, yeah, of course, he's going to try and do something about that line, you know. And um, if you're a farmer that spent the last 12, uh, you know, six, six, 12 months growing, preparing, and then growing a crop of maize corn, and then in one night a herd of elephants come through and trash the whole thing, and you know we've got no income now the next six, 12 months, and you've also got half a dozen kids, a wife, who are going to literally starve now because you've got nothing you got no money mm -hmm. and that's the reality of the people that live over there and then so that's where i think you've always got to try and put yourself in those their shoes before you just jump into accusing them of certain things you know it's always you make sure you get all the facts and that's where so a lot of the work um, that's been done over there with different organizations is trying to give those people the tools to turn around and say look if you've got cows for example and you have a cow that dies out in the paddock don't leave it there. Don't leave it there. Go and collect it up. Go and dispose of the body somewhere. If you leave that there, it's a pretty easy feed for a lion. Then if you do that on a regular basis, the lion starts going, they taste pretty good, pretty easy to eat. Next time he walks in, there's not a dead one, but there's a slow-moving living one, he, he grabs a hold of it. And so you've nearly conditioned that lion to eat this, and, uh, and then it tastes pretty good. And so there's little things like that where you can turn around, which is a very simple thing. You know, um, If we see with some of the lions or animals that are collared, 
you can contact the village and say, look, this animal is moving into your area. Maybe put all the animals into bomers and safeguard, um, safe houses over the next couple of nights until he's moved back out of the area and stuff. And so you can give them some tools which actually they see as um, uh, help because you know you're just going over there dictating to them and telling them what to do, you know, because it's, it's their country. It's their country, it's their property, it's um, their, their livelihood. And you can't go in there just... Um, shouting from the rooftops, telling them they're doing the wrong thing. You've got to work with them. And um, if we get from a wildlife conservation point of view, I think education is is so important. But it's educating and empowering the people that live in and around those areas, rather than just um, shouting at them or pointing the, pointing the finger. Yeah, well said. Yeah, we do a, we do a lot of shows in the country regions with Animals Anonymous, and I'm always surprised. You know, what did TAFE and Union things you always learn about? The farmers are doing this wrong, and they're doing that wrong, and that's why we don't have this species. But when you meet the people that live out on the land, a lot of them love it. They love it. Yeah. Mm, they've got threatened species in their property, and they're not going to tell the government where they are. And they, you know, they take a lot of pride in having those animals in their properties. Do you find things like that too over there, big cats? Yeah, exactly. Especially with some of the the camera traps we're talking about before you know they turn around it's like uh, yeah if they've got something like a a caracal or brown hyena or something that's a bit more of a secretive animal and they realize with these cameras they get a bit of an insight to the secret life i guess of these animals that share their property because a lot of these properties like in australia they're very big properties a lot of them and um and they take a lot of pride in having the wildlife on there and caring for the wildlife and, and they can they, they can usually find that balance quite nicely between yeah yeah we'll do our bit for protecting the wildlife but we've still got to make a livelihood at the same time and that's when i was saying before about seeing themselves as part of the environment i think it's really important i think anything any topic or any argument if you get to the point of then it's just us and them and, and shouting at each other there's you're never gonna get a good result that way you know i think it's a bit of a, a lost art unfortunately um where people can just sit down and be like even we are today and you just sit and talk and you can agree to disagree and you can talk about it openly and you don't have to get to the point where you're calling each other's names and shouting each other and you know jumping on and i'm gonna do you know with again so, social media and stuff it's very easy to jump on there and and shout from the rooftops uh, and so we've lost that art of just communicating uh where you can just talk you can just talk about things and uh you can shake hands and walk away and go yeah different opinions but that's okay you know that's okay yeah it's very hard social media you often see uh, arguments go pear-shaped very quickly whereas in real life people are generally quite nice and quite civil um but but even in real life too it's also important to find that area where we can both agree i mean there's always going to be a baseline where we can agree and sort of go from there yeah yeah so if people come to the center here what can they expect well, me usually to open up the door and say g'day to start off. <laughs> it's a very small team we've got here. But the, the sender's set up primarily for very small groups, like, you said, like two to four people, you know, and the first thing when people do arrive is we, we sit down, we have a bit of a chat about their, their interests or, or um, their, what animals they might have a particular focus on. Some people, most people come out here about the cats, you know, which is, I guess, understandably calling ourselves the Wild Cat Conservation Centre. It's mainly cat lovers that do come out here. And uh, we have a bit of a chat first up, get their interest, talk a bit about the work we do here, and then make a bit of a plan. And because they're the only ones here, if you come out here, you're the only ones here for that hour, hour and a half. Nobody else is joining us. We don't join groups. And um, we sort of have a chat to them about cat behaviour. So one of the first things I do, I, a lot of them do have domestic cats, which is um, a, a good thing in the fact they already know a little bit about cats and what cats are like and how different cats are to dogs you know and and i talk a little bit about why i like cats so much and that you've got to work hard for those relationships and they don't just give it off and say i can walk down the street here and see a dog he wags his tail i'm his new best friend <laughs> whereas a cat sees and just gives you the finger and walks the other way <laughs> generally speaking and um but i don't mind that you've got to work hard to form the relationship with cats and the, we explain how the cats come first here, you know. So the cats definitely come first, the guests are second, you know. One of the unique things we do here with the cats is we move them around a bit. So they move around enclosures a, a fair bit. And we also take them out for, for walks. So, um, and that's every day whether we've got guests here or not. And the primary reason around that is to extend their lives beyond their in, in, enclosures or e exhibits. And it's something that cats would obviously... It, I turn around and look at it this way. Like, if, if you've got, you go to the best enclosure... What I tell the guests here when they, when they come here, I'll, I'll, pret I'll pretend you guys are, are guests uh, 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 that have just arrived here at the centre. So I'm moving around in my chair here, so I'm creaking a lot. I turn around and say, imagine if I said to you guys, I'm going to put you in the best hotel room in the world and you can order as much room service as you want, all on me. Sold. <laughs> I haven't finished yet, Steve. Oh. And 
any musical artists you want, I can, I'll invite them in. They'll come and perform for you privately in the room. Uh, anything that I can get physically into your room, into this room, you can have for the rest of your life. Though the only catch is you never get to come out. You've got to stay there. Then that's the way I try and pitch it to people when they turn around and go, OK, well, that's good maybe, but I reckon after a couple of weeks... Tops, it's a bit like Big Brother, isn't it? After a certain period of time, you're going you're gonna to want to get out. You're going to start going, well, I want to get out. I want to see what's beyond this. This is amazing in here. I know you've given me as much enrichment as you possibly can, but I, 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 just, I just need something. I need a change. And so that's what we do with the cats here. So we've basically got the um, above uh, zoo standard enclosures for everything, and we do that same level of um, in- enrichment, you know, with the animals. Though the walks is the one of those great things that we can do, and so the cats um, get to come out of the, uh, the enclosures, and it's their time, and it gives them choice. And this is the interesting thing, I think. Um, some people have a misconception that if you put an animal on a leash, you're taking away choice from it. Though I think if you actually come and witness it and understand how it's done well it actually is the opposite it gives them choice so for example we can go into the yard see which cheetah wants to um, come out for a wander collar and leash and then we go for a walk and it's the cat's time and the cat gets to choose where the cat wants to go and what it wants to do and anybody comes out and joins us on a walk you can actually see that cat thinking you can actually see that cat going okay well what am I going to do next I might go over there okay Check that out. Now I might go over here, especially the small cats, especially the servals and the caracals. Um, the servals will turn around, they'll hear something in the grass. They'll go, what's that over there? And next minute they'll pounce, they'll pounce, and they'll leap up in the air, pounce down on, they're searching around the grass trying to find what it is. And at that moment, the guests can actually look at the cat, they can observe the cat, they can see the ears moving, reaching out and see what it does with its tail, they can see how it conditions its body before it does pounce. They're actually, it's like a live documentary. They're actually watching a serval doing what a serval does. They can 100% watch and realise that's why it's built the way it is. That's why it has the ears. That's why it's got a short tail. And watch it move, chase, chase the skink, and then turn around and go, right, yeah, and then it gets back on its walk. And they watch the way it camouflages in amongst the grass as it's walking here. We're lucky here. Um, most people in the Hawkesbury don't like it, but there's a lot of African love grass through our property, which is a noxious weed in the Hawkesbury. Works for us. Um, and the cats get in amongst the grass and they go, wow, that coat, look how well it camouflages in amongst the grass. And then the cat might lay down for a while and then we just hang around, wait for the cat to get up again and move again. And they actually see why these animals are designed the way they are. They can learn so much more in that moment. Watching this cheat, uh, leeching the cheetah or watching the serval be a serval. And the animal forgets it's got a leash and collar on. And it's turning around, then at the end of the walk, we wander back and we get the next, next cut out for a walk. And, uh, and we change up every day. There's no use. Again, you lose that enrichment level. Uh, if you turn around at 11 o'clock, the cat gets walked every day. That becomes routine then. You know, so... We get up every day and we change it. We just think, well, who's going to walk next? Okay, you're coming now. And so there's that variety in there as well. And you can see how much all the cats benefit from it. They turn around and get out and about. We've got a new area that uh, we're starting to fence out the back at the moment, which is about a uh, 10-acre area, which is being fenced off with cheetah-proof fencing. And that'll be one big, large savannah area where the cheetahs can actually go out. And we will take them out there off-leash as well. So we'll take them out there and unclip them and take them for a le- off-leash. And they'll um, wander around and hang out there as well. And so it's basically being able to the cats, allowing the cats to exhibit as much natural behaviour as possible in its captive life. And that's what our philosophy is here. It's not about keeping them wild and keeping them as wild as possible. It's uh, because it's not the wild, is it? It's, it's captivity. And so our philosophy is about giving, letting them exhibit as many natural behaviours as possible in its captive life. So giving it the best possible captive life. And that's what our focus on is here with the cats. And so I know I've gone off on a bit of a tangent from what the guests get to experience, though it's, I think it's that thing where if people are trying to work out how they can... What, what they get when they come out here and why we do the walks, that is a big part of it. And so what the guests then do is they, when they arrive after that first chat, they just join us on the walks. And we make it really clear, look, this is the cat's time. I can't tell you what the cat's going to do because the cat doesn't know. And that's great. That's, a, that's, that's 100% what we want. I can't tell you what it's going to do because it's the cat's, the cat's decision. 
And uh, we say to everybody, look, we're not setting up photo ops. We don't set up photo opportunities here. We're not like sort of some places in, um, not to bag anybody in particular, but in Southeast Asia and Thailand where there's some questionable practices with tigers and things where the animals are, are drugged or chained. They don't have any choice over there. They're, they're doing that photo whether they want to or not. And we say to people, if that's what you came out here for, you're going to be disappointed because it's the cat's time. If the cat does stop somewhere lays down or sits somewhere and we can yeah and you can come in and say hi and give he or she a little pat and get a photo with it that's great that's a little bit of a a bonus you know where you can turn and get that in the opportunity as well and most people do most people do on the walks because the cats are very relaxed on the walks and and they're used to people joining us and but the cats again the cats know that they're the guests they're the guests i'm in charge here especially if we've got one cheetah here um we nickname her the queen uh queen ziva and we always say to the guests you're walking with the queen today so Show the respect, you know, and turn around and, and she'll dictate. She'll dictate the walk and you've just got to sort of go along with it. And, and generally speaking, most visitors we have out here love that. They love the fact that the, um, the cats come first and they, it's not just us saying it, they can see it with their own eyes. It's great to think that they can still act a bit wild even though they're in captivity. Um, but that's good. I like that. Yeah, there's, there's those natural behaviours. And you can actually see, and a lot of guests come out here and they say, God, you know, like I, I go to zoos and you see the cat just laying there asleep. And, you, and if it's doing nothing, you don't read the signage. You don't read the, you know, the best graphics in the world uh, and you know, animations or whatever. And you might watch it, but most people are there to look at animals. And then they'll just keep walking. They'll just keep walking to the next place. It's um, the same as you guys when you do your demonstrations, Adrian. People actually see animals doing stuff. I remember talking about that, uh, what was it, did we grow on six years ago? Six years ago, <laughs> doing that, where you brought out one of the gliders, and the glider was gliding around the room. And people can say, oh, that's a glider being a glider. Yeah, it's, it's a captive environment, but that's what it is. It's a captive environment. These cheetahs aren't, we're not in Botswana. Mm. We're in Wilberforce. And so we've got to give them the best captive life possible. There's nothing at all wild about an animal living just in its enclosure, its, its, its whole its whole life there's nothing really wild about that at all it's um and if that's the case well we're going to just put food in there occasionally and then just as about to get it then pull it away and don't give it um or you got to give it live food no you're not going to do this but that's that's the wild then if you really want to go we want to keep them as wild as possible um and i say that to people we could put if we wanted to with the cheetahs we put the food in there drag it through the yard really quick make them miss out you know half the week and everybody would be like you cruel buggers, you can't do that to them. And you go, well, hang on, do you want us to keep them as wild as possible? That's what happens in the wild. They don't get, every time they hunt, they don't get their food. Um, so, yeah, it's always an interesting balance and re- uh, interesting arguments, I think, with, with people at times when, they, when you start talking about animals in captivity, you know, and um, the role of them and, 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 and what you should and shouldn't do with them. I think that's something people don't realise about enrichment is, like, for instance, I've got fat-tailed dunnarts and they've got a little running wheel but it's not in there every day because if it was in there every day, it's not enrichment, that's normal. Yeah. You know, it goes in like maybe once a week or something and you hear them in there. <laughs> and then you take it out really quickly. Really quickly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it, 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 that's the thing. Like what is, you know, enrichment, I think over the last, uh, like um, I've been, I guess, in the, the zoo industry for quite a while now and you, nowadays you, you just look at people and they talk about, you know, all these enrichment programs and enrichment structures and um, or a lot of people nowadays it's about being I'm an animal trainer and I'm an, I train animals and I'm an animal trainer. Whereas when I first started in the industry, which is, you know, over 20 years ago now, you just did all those things anyway. That was what I considered being a good keeper was you would change things up for the animal. You'd put different things in there and in, enrich their lives. And you might, if, you know, oh, I need the animal to do this for me, yeah, I'd do a little bit of um, training and conditioning, you know, to get the animal to do what I won't want him or her to do. That was just being a zookeeper. That was just being an, uh, or a wildlife keeper. That was just part of your job. Whereas now it's funny, I always get a bit of a laugh when there's people that have specific titles and that's what I do. I'm a specialist in that area. And you go, well, if I'm, there must be some pretty average keepers out there then if you weren't just doing that anyway because that's part of just looking after and making sure you're giving your animals in your care the best possible life. It's just what, you, 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 what we all should be doing. When you first started working with cats and you say, like, they're not dogs, they're not obsequious, they're not all over you, what, what were some of the first breakthroughs you had with, with a cat? Yeah, look, I guess it's that thing where um, being able to understand with any animal, reading body language and, um, and working and knowing how to read, read an animal. And that's where I think it's um, like we do uh, the walks, like I mentioned before, and different stuff with our cats here. But I, I've never, ever considered myself, like I was saying before, an animal trainer, though I think I can read animal behaviour reasonably well and I think that becomes from a my time in working with animals in captivity but also the work we do um, over overseas in, in the field 
And so you can get to read animal behavior and understand, and understand them a little bit better. And that's and communicate them on their level because all our cats here, like we've got the five cheetahs here, and every single one of those is different personality. So you've A, got, yes, they're all cheetahs, so you have that information, and then I take into account uh, what are the behavioural traits of Ziva compared to Duke, and then you add that to the top of the mix. So it's a bit like, I guess, if, it's, uh, if you're making a cake, you put all the different ingredients in there. So you know, it's a cheetah I'm working with. Okay, so these are general rules for cheetahs, um, which is just there because that's what animal it is. Then you get to know, is it male or female? Uh, and then it's individual behaviour, and you keep adding these different ingredients in to then the mix that you're going to come up with and how you're going to work with that cat. And so if we get a new cat in, you know, you spend a lot of time just trying to watch the cat and observe the cat and turn around and get an understanding of how you're going to approach that cat for the first time. And then that's basically, uh, you know, body language. We talk a lot out here about... Um, uh, the three C's I always talk about to the, the staff, which is calm, confident and consistent, which are the three things I think from my um, years, and it's, again, it's just my opinion, that they're the things you've got to have in place if you're going to be working around um, cats, but also a lot of other animals. And if one of those isn't missing, if you ever have an issue, usually you can find that one of those things is missing. Um, cats love that calm confidence you know um, they don't really like the high energy like if you've got a dog and you might like the high energy and get him up and revved up cats generally don't really like that too much so calm confidence they like to know what they're going to get it's um it's often if you have people with a domestic cat and they have a friend over and then the person who hates cats and he's sitting there next minute the cat jumps on them and go what are you doing me for i don't like cats get off you know the cats pick that person out usually because they go i just like the energy you're giving off you're just sitting there doing your thing you're not fussed about me at all you're my type of person. I'm just that, that nonchalant, I'm just doing your, your thing. And that's what cats like. You know, if you focus too much on the cats, the cats are going to read you a mile away, you know. Um, and how you approach the cat, you know, eye, eye contact a big one, you know, cats greet by. They like that slow blink and the blinking of the eyes and stuff. You don't, they don't want a strong hold, eye, high, hold that strong eye contact because they don't know you. It's too, you know, it's too personal, you know. And so uh, body language and energy is massively important. So we talk a lot about energy levels here, which, uh, you know, probably drives the, the, the staff a bit nutty after a while. But it's so much, it's not so much what you say or, or what you do, it's your energy, you know. You, I can go in there with any of our cats and you can communicate with them without saying a, a word or doing a certain thing. It's just what you're giving off, you know, and that's they're, they're very good level as cats, and I think that's why I like them because they, they've got a good... Can I say bullshit? They've got a good... Um, yep, you just did. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, so they've got a good bullshit. They go, if you try and go, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not nervous at all. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to work the cat. You know, I'm going to hang out with it. They, they'll see through you pretty quick, you know, and most animals, most animals do are the same. They'll, they'll do it, it's that, and that's what I think... The, the best animal keepers are people that can actually just are comfortable around animals can read animal behaviour. As I said, whether it's an, I've been fortunate, I've worked with lots of different animals, um, whether it's the cats or elephants or, you know, or primates, which are very intelligent, and, and it's all the same. You've just got to be able to read animals and, and be comfortable around them, and then they'll be comfortable around you. It's exactly the same, even with something like a snake. Yeah. It's the confidence and, and how you're acting around the animal. Yes, yeah. it's, it's amazing. Yeah, and I think that's where, um, unfortunately, I think in the, in some areas of the industry, as um, for, like the zoo industry, that, that's being lost a little bit. That's being lost a little bit. Where you know things are, those skills, just aren't there necessarily, and because people are spending too much time, not everywhere, but too much time in the in the office, putting you know, on the computer, putting programs and things schedules and different things in place just spend it without with the animals i know that's at the end of the day that's why i do what i do i just grew up i loved animals i love being around animals and sharing my life with them and and that's why i i did and do what i i do i just love being around them you know and, and spending time with them and so i um yeah to this day it's that's why i get most joy out of just when i'm out you know before you guys go this morning i was out with the cheetahs sorting a few things out and you know fluffing a few hay beds up and doing this and doing that and just checking on all the cats and talking to them all and and, that, and that's why we do what we do. You know, as you say, whether it's a snake or a cat or a monkey, you know, it's, it's, it's all the same. Yeah, it's awesome. You can see you love them because you can sit on your lounge, you guys, and look out the window, and there they are. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. We turn around and um, we live, live on site here, which is important, I think, if you know. We, it's, it's very much a privilege to have the animals uh, here, here with us and uh, we keep a close eye on them that way, you know, and so we turn around. Yeah, even from where we're having this chat now, as you say, you can look out. I can't see any cheetahs, but it's just starting to mist rain a little bit. You got one? You can see one, Steve? I can yeah. see one. Okay, good. That's validated then. Um, and, um, <laughs> there's definitely a cheetah. There's definitely there. a cheetah out there. Good. Um, I'd be a bit concerned if there wasn't. It actually. was running off in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Um, um, and so, yeah, it's nice. It's, you know, very, like I said before, very, very fortunate, you know, to be able to share our lives um, with the animals and do something that we love. You know, it's a, it's, it's a way of life. It's not a job, which um, anybody that works in the industry knows. You know, you turn around and you don't get days off. Uh, generally speaking, it's because the animals come first. They don't know whether it's birthday, Christmas, Saturday, Sunday. It's a, another day to them, you know, and so it's, um, which uh, comes with its um, challenges at the time, trying to get, you know, that work life balance uh though um yeah it's i, I can't complain too much because we did it to ourselves and so but no it's both myself and carly feel very fortunate that we get to live here and um yeah share our share our lives with these with these animals yeah it's all right it's going to stay for a few days Steve. You know? <laughs> stay, stay, stay for a few days but yeah, um, with the Burmese pythons absolutely <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah so that's what basically when people come out we just want them to you know if they didn't already form a bit of a love and appreciation for wild cats learn about like we was saying before um some of the lesser known species and that'll be our focus moving forward hopefully acquiring some other species that um are not as well known and uh, people can come out here and learn about them and also the the work that we support over in um, and the work we keep doing over in um, Botswana which uh, again is important that you turn around put your money where your mouth is if you're gonna if you say you're doing something for conservation you you, you better be doing it you know yeah well said that's great can yeah. I ask you a completely random question yeah oh god here we go uh, here we go um, <laughs> I'm looking around our <laughs> small house here going have you spotted something what is you're it going to turn around and <laughs> no no um, we, we did an episode with a friend of mine called Neil Waters lovely guy you're going to ask him if he's got phylocenes here no I'm not going to ask about oh, that okay. uh, he, he's the guy he's the repository for all the strange sightings of animals around Australia yeah and he gets a lot of calls very regularly from doctors, lawyers, farmers, just general, just normal people that see big cats. Do I get those same calls? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, yeah, look, we do. Over the years, we've got a bunch of different, um, different sightings. And a lot of the ones I think are wallabies, especially on this show, swamp wallabies. You know, they just, people just see that dark back end of the wallaby just as it's hitting the grass on the side of the road, that long tail. And um, I've seen it a few times myself, and it's funny, it takes me back to Africa, and I sort of have to catch myself, and go, oh, the swamp wallaby, that's right, because you just see that long tail and that hind rump just going into um, the grass. So I think a lot of them can be put down to swamp wallabies or potentially, you know, depending on where you're living, um, agiles or, or redneck wallabies. People, I think, also don't realise how big some feral cats can get, you know, and they see a big feral cat like that's like close to 10 kilos and go, wow, that's a big cat. It's usually always when you can break it down and have these conversations with people, you can get a bit of an idea of what they've actually seen, you know. The, 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 there's been a few cases, though. We, we went, this is going back uh, a, f- a few years now, we went out with um, Hawkesbury Council to a property where, not far from here actually, where the guy said, oh, look, I've had a leopard come in and, um, well, I think he said a panther, but, you know, a panther's a black leopard, um, and took a goat up a tree. And so I've got a dead goat hanging in this tree. I've got some claw marks on the tree. Can you come investigate it? So I went out there with a few of the council rangers and it looked like a bloke had had a dead goat and he'd, he'd flung up into the tree. And I pretty much said it that way. I, with most things in life, I will always give my opinion on things. And I said to him, mate, it looks like you'd, you'd thrown the get- go up there and done a few scratch marks on the tree and he was he was quite upset by me by me because i didn't buy into it at all and left the property and then it was about probably about uh, from memory it was a few months later uh, about eight weeks later and then council contacted me and said you know that property you went out to seen the the leopard panther again and there's another goat in the tree but this time there's um some Pug marks is one of the things I mentioned before. I said, mate, you know, it's on the edge of a dam here. There'd be some mark. I'd be, you'd be able to find some, some sign that the, there was a cat that walked through. And they said, and apparently now he's found some pug marks going around the edge of the dam. And What's he's pug mark? Uh, so like a paw mark, a paw so mark. a print mark, you know, a print mark in the... And so, yeah, the leopard's come in, apparently, taken this goat up the tree and then left these marks. And he, and he said, in particular, he wants you to come out. He wants you to come out and because and, and he, he wants you to see this. And I went, sure. So went out there and turned up the council and uh, had a few extra council people with us this time. And we're looking at these pug marks and 
the goats hanging up in the tree and I'm looking at the pug marks and I was <laughs> looking at them and I go, you know what? I said, these, um, yep, I said, these are actually leopard tracks. And council's faces were just like your jaws like on the ground and, and, and the owner of the property's chest started coming out and he's sticking the chest out and thinking. And then, <laughs> and yeah, basically, and I was like, the only thing I can't quite work out is that the leopards walked through this area just on its front feet. <laughs> And then council at this point are going, do they do that, Ben? Do they, does, does that happen? And I'm like, no, not generally. I haven't seen this before, you know, in, in, in Botswana any time. And then the owner of the property is still going, well, no, no, that's the tracks he left or she left. And I said, mate, there's no um, – you didn't put any back, back foot pug marks in. So I said, good job. You know, I don't know where you got the leopard – Poor from you must have cut off an old skin somewhere or something so he'd done a, half the job basically because uh, the pace even the areas he'd set them apart was pretty good but um yeah so he was devastated never heard from him again uh, or council so my I, they, they, I don't think they're out there you know there's a lot of people that um, people might listen to this and disagree with me though i think that most of them are sightings of um yeah wallabies or other animals and because uh, they don't live that long you know and 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 so to have a, that many out there that they're breeding that regularly, that they can still be out there after this, this amount of time, um, I, yeah, I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think there's any leopards or pumas out running around the wild in Australia. I wish there was. It'd be good. Some new genetics. We could, uh, <laughs> we could, ca- we could catch, the, catch them up and uh, be good. That's hilarious. It's a bit like Bigfoot sightings in America can often be put down to bears when they just walk around standing. When you see them. They look ridiculous. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. There's always usually something that people have turned around and seen. And uh, it's, I think especially in today's uh, age with the mobile phones, everybody's got a camera on them nowadays. And it's always the funniest thing when somebody has a sighting again, it's the grainiest, crappiest footage you've ever seen. You're thinking, <laughs> what, well, surely somebody would have got a good photo or something by now but it's things like i know you mentioned the fire scene before yeah wouldn't it be amazing if somebody did find them you know it'd just be you know it'd be the 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 find of the century if you you know um especially something like that that was so recently lost that you know it was 100 percent us um so there you know you always do hold on hope you know um so you know i'd much prefer somebody to find a fire scene uh in australia than a than a black panther that's for sure Mm, yeah well said is there anything that you want to add? Well, it's, it's well. just that because if you've got people that are passionate and genuine and are really interested, yeah. that's why we do what we do. We do it because we're trying to get those people to love and, you know, animals than, even more than they already do. And so if, if, if they're in that moment, you don't want to, you know, it's, um, you know, we have people leaving the tours here and they're, they're hugging us and giving us kisses when they go, you know, it's because they've just really... That was a hint. Yeah, I expect, I expect one, boys. Um, it's, uh, they just, yeah, because it's, you know that those messages are getting across. Because it's, it's just amazing. The Savannah area will be um, finished off in, um, by October, November. And so if you guys want to come back once it's opened up and we can sit out there and have a chat in the Savannah with the cheetahs. And uh, if they want to come over and have a bit of a purr and say hi and we can talk a bit more about, you know wildcat conservation and work in Botswana and it's a base, the closest I can get just to Botswana we'll sit out in the paddock um, in the back in the savannah with the, uh, with the cats and have a chat there if you like no, that's all right. That would <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, that'd be amazing yeah. that'd be amazing yeah, that no, would be good. and then when we're sat out there talking about that then at the end of that we can talk about next step is sitting in Botswana yeah, it, doing it, the same thing. That, if if you guys want to turn around, I'm across there about five or six times a year. So if you really? if you wow. want to um, jump, I know we haven't talked much about um, Botswana in this chat, but if yeah, if you you know, yeah, just say next step, we can talk about it a bit more, and then I'm sure all your uh, listeners and followers would then like to see you know that um, Aaron and Steve take on Africa, you know, yeah. and turn around and do well, some it's chats over than there. Me constantly going on about going back to Borneo because that's my favourite place, Borneo. I love it. Um, and I'm always saying, oh, we need to go back to Borneo. <laughs> I think everyone says, Steve, go somewhere else for crying out loud. Yeah, so Botswana, it starts with B, so you've got some length there. Yeah, that's it, yeah. yeah so, yeah, yeah Botswana. It's a yeah. start. Yeah, it starts out there. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing it. Yes. Yeah. yeah, no, as I said, more than welcome guys out here anytime. And uh, if you want to join us in Botswana, also welcome anytime. Thank you. Mate, thanks so much for your time. No, pleasure. Awesome. And guys, thank you for listening. <laughs>